Welcome to Old Western Culture. Uh, we're talking about Roman literature in this series of lectures, and specifically now we're starting a new unit on the historians. We'll be talking uh, in the next series of lectures about the Romans who wrote about Roman history, uh, who picked up on the idea of history from the Greek historians and developed it in a particularly a uniquely Roman direction, uh, in the direction of the Roman idea that we talked about earlier in the epics. That shows up in the historians as well. Uh, and some of the most famous episodes in Roman history that many of us uh, have read about in, in uh, earlier history studies and, and so on will be covered in these particular historians. The historians we'll be talking about in this unit uh, are Livy, who lives in the first century BC, Sallust, who also lives in the first century BC, uh, Tacitus, who lives in the first century AD, uh, Julius Caesar, uh, the famous general and dictator, uh, who lives in the first century BC, and Plutarch, first century AD. In other words, all the historians we'll be talking about fall within the space of 200 years, the first centuries before and after Christ. Most of the great literature of ancient Rome falls into this period. Uh, many people consider all of the literature, history, poetry, philosophy, and so on, that was written during the first century BC to be part of what they call Golden Age Latin literature and everything written during the first century AD, after Christ, Silver Age Latin literature. Because although it's great, it's not quite as great uh, as the earlier stuff. In previous lectures, you may have listened to me talking about the, the epic poets Lucan and Statius. They wrote in the first century after Christ, and so they are Silver Age epic poets. Aeneas, uh, or the Aeneid rather, written by Virgil, takes place, or is written, composed in the first century BC, and so it's Golden Age literature. So the historians that I'll be talking about in this next series of lectures uh, mostly wrote during the first century BC and AD, during the same time as the epic poets that I talked about in the previous series. So we haven't really moved in time. We're in the same time period just talking about a different kind of literature. Uh, today I'll be talking about the historian Livy. Uh, Livy uh, 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 is born around 59 BC, dies around 17 AD. That is, uh, he's born during the civil wars that I talked about in previous lectures, which were ended finally by Octavian or Caesar Augustus around 30 BC. So um, the, the historian Livy is about 30 years old when the civil wars come to an end. He's lived through this time of tumult, uh, this time of chaos. Uh, he's a conservative like, uh, uh, like um, uh, uh, Virgil is. And he uh, agrees with Julius Caesar's, or rather Caesar Augustus's, attempt to revive the morals of Rome and to return Rome back to the earlier days when she was better and not so corrupt. And that's one of the themes that we're about to talk about in this history. Uh, Livy becomes a historian in his, uh, uh, in his uh, um, uh, adulthood, and he writes a history of Rome in about 150 books a very extensive uh, history of the, of the entire course of, of Rome from the founding, uh, legendarily by Aeneas, down to his own day, about 1,200 years of history. Unfortunately, of these 150 or so, 153 volumes that he wrote, only 30 some odd, 35 maybe have survived. Uh, and I'm actually only gonna be talking about the first five. We don't have time to talk about all of them, but the first five books of Livy's history, uh, the early history of Rome, are very representative uh, and, uh, 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 and uh, contain some of the most famous stories. I'll mention some of the other things he writes about in later books, but I'm gonna focus on the first five books of Livy's history uh, in our discussion uh, today and in the next several lectures. So uh, Livy is a conservative, he's a historian, uh, he's uh, famous, has a good reputation. He dies, as I said, in AD 17, which means that he's dying, uh, his, his death falls during the time of Christ's early adulthood. Of course, there's no connection. There's no way that Livy really knew about what was going on in Judea, nor would he have cared. And uh, there's uh, no reason that Jesus should have ever have mentioned or the gospel writers should ever have mentioned Livy. Uh, but it helps to put them together uh, chronologically and to imagine them living at the same time period so that we don't make the mistake of doing what we often do, and that is keeping our biblical history and secular history uh, in these separate watertight categories. We want to see them as, as happening at the same time. So Livy is writing in the, in the early decades or the, or the remaining decades of the BC period, right up until the time of Christ and shortly after Christ lives. The, uh, 
uh, the story that Livy tells is the story of the beginnings of Rome, her rise to greatness under the monarchs, and then under the new republic after a revolution that overthrows the monarchs, uh, her, uh, her, her rise to triumph as an empire throughout the entire Mediterranean basin, and then the gradual, uh, uh, her gradual decay in morals, although she's great in extent and great in power. And so what I'm going to do today uh, is talk about the very beginning of his book and the philosophy of history that he espouses and some of the things that uh, to, to this very day a modern uh, cultural conservatives like to quote because they're so appropriate. But I want to make one more comment about his influence. I've mentioned this before, but it's worth repeating. Uh, in, the, uh, in the early days of America, among the founding fathers uh, in the late colonial period and early republic period of, of American independence, Roman historians were the most loved and widely read books of, from the classical world among the educated, literate founders of our country. Excluding the Bible and biblical commentaries and, uh, and, uh, and, and works of, uh, of theology, outside of that, which were the most dominant forms uh, uh, and most popular kinds of reading for most of the early Americans, Roman history was the most uh, popular form, uh, far beyond, say, uh, the poetry of Homer or of Virgil. Romans loved their Roman history, and the reason is they saw in the Roman model of government something that they could build America upon. Uh, they understood very clearly that the Romans, or rather the Greeks, attempt at democracy uh, in ancient Athens in the 5th century BC uh, was a failed model. The founding fathers, as you can see uh, in reading their writings, the, uh, uh, the, the documents known as the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Papers, in these documents and others, you can see that the founding fathers hated and feared strict democracy. Democracy, they saw, would be a disaster. That's what Athens had, and it was a disaster. But the Romans came up with a different kind of government, a representative republic, a constitutional republic. And the founding fathers of our country saw that that would be a valuable model. And that's why our country today, constitutionally, is a, is a republic, a representative republic, not a democracy. We have democratic principles in that everyone has a voice in, in uh, appointing their legislators, but then the legislators themselves take care of uh, the business of doing law. In other words, in a republic, Following the ancient Roman model, there's a buffer between the people and power. So uh, uh, the, Amer the early Americans uh, loved their Roman historians, and Livy is one of the people that they, that they uh, loved and read most, up there with Tacitus and Sallust and Plutarch, uh, probably the four most famous Roman historians. In the beginning, the very beginning of Livy's work, uh, he talks about how reluctant he is to write uh, a history, because so many historians before him have done so, and done so well. Uh, and so he hopes, he says, that he'll not be put too much into, into the shade by the nobility of his, of his predecessors in writing history, but he's going to do it anyway because he thinks he has something, something to contribute. He goes on uh, and he says that um, uh, he's going to go back to the, to the legendary founding of Rome. And he doesn't think that's an ignoble or illegitimate thing to do, although we might question the truth of those legendary stories. Or was there really an Aeneas? Did he really do what the poet Virgil said? Uh, did all the things that Romulus uh, is claimed to do in the legends, did they really happen? He says, oh, uh, we, may, we may not agree with those things, uh, but they, he says, they lend nobility and dignity to our national past. The fact that we Romans, he says, think that Mars is one of the founder, founding fathers of Rome because Mars, uh, um, uh, in union with a, um, uh, uh, with a mortal woman, uh, gave, uh, um, uh, gave rise to Romulus. So the fact that we think that Mars is one of the founding gods of our country tells us something about ourselves that, th that we understand ourselves to be a successful warlike military people. Mars is our father. The fact that Venus is one of our, uh, is one of our founding uh, um, uh, goddesses uh, is significant. She's the mother of the hero Aeneas, the legendary character Aeneas. Whether or not the story is true, it's significant that we think so, that we think that Aeneas and, and the Romans are descendants of the goddess Venus. That's why we put so much emphasis on love, uh, says, uh, says Livy here. And here you might compare this with uh, uh, American legendary stories. Uh, Americans like to tell the story of uh, George Washington as a little boy chopping down a cherry tree with the little hatchet that his father gave him. And then when confronted, he says, Father, I cannot tell a lie. It was me with my little hatchet. 
Well, chances are this is a story invented by a, n a man named Parson Weems in the 19th century. It never happened at all. But the fact that the story is repeated by generations of Americans tells us something about our opinion of ourselves. We like to think of ourselves as an honest people. And so this story embodies our opinion of ourselves as essentially honest. Uh, stories about uh, uh, Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox or Pecos Bill, these wild legendary heroes, tell us something about ourselves, our belief, our belief that we as a people can do anything, that we're independent, that we're a sort of a can-do nation of people, there are no obstacles in our way. And so our legendary stories, whether or not they're true, the fact that we like them and tell them about ourselves tells us something about our national character. And so that's what Livy says here about the stories of Aeneas and perhaps about Romulus and so on. Even if these early legendary stories lack full veracity, the fact that we love them and repeat them to every new generation tells us what we think about ourselves as a Roman people. But then he comes in his introduction to one of the most famous passages in ancient history. Now, people still quote this, and rightly so. There's some tremendously valuable philosophy of history going on here. This is what he says. Uh, and I'm reading here, by the way, from the Penguin Classics edition of Livy's Early History of Rome, uh, translated uh, by um, uh, a man named Aubrey de Selincourt. There are a number of other translations that are very good. I happen to like this one, uh, and it's, uh, it's got uh, a good introduction, it's got good commentary, it's easy to read, um, although it's certainly not the only one you could use, but it's the one that I like. And so uh, if you're looking for a recommendation, uh, this is the one I'd recommend. He says this, these, however, referring to the previous discussion about uh, legendary history, these, however, are comparatively trivial matters, and I set little store by them. I invite the reader's attention to the much more serious consideration of the kind of lives our ancestors lived, of who were the men and what the means, both in politics and war, by which Rome's power was first acquired and subsequently expanded. I would then have him trace the process of our moral decline to watch first the sinking of the foundations of morality as the old teaching was allowed to lapse, then the rapidly increasing disintegration, then the final collapse of the whole edifice and the dark dawning of our modern day when we can neither endure our vices nor the remedies needed to cure them. The study of history is the best medicine for a sick mind. For in history you have a record of the infinite variety of human experience plainly set out for all to see, and in that record you can find for yourself and your country, both examples and warnings, fine things to take as models, base things rotten through and through to avoid. Classic statement about the philosophy of history. And I'd like to go back and just point out a few things about this paragraph. First, he says, uh, let's set aside these legendary histories we are talking about. I invite the reader's attention to the serious consideration of the kind of lives our ancestors lived, who were the men and what the means, both in politics and war, by which Rome's power was first acquired and subsequently expanded. History is driven by the choices of individuals. History is not dominated, as Karl Marx would say in the 1800s, by impersonal forces. History is not dominated, as Fred, uh, Frederick Hegel would say uh, in the 1700s, by uh, forces of thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and so on. History is dominated by people by the choices that men make. And so he asks us to consider the kind of lives our ancestors lived, their character, because it's the character that determines choices, and it's the choices that men make that drives history. And so he says that this is the kind of thing that we ought to look at uh, as having driven the rise of Rome to power through politics and warfare. But then he says, I would have him, the reader, trace the process of our moral decline to watch first the sinking of the foundations of morality as the old teaching was allowed to lapse. And so, and so now we see, uh, Livy says, we're going to look back in history and see how the corruption began to set in, the corruption that we see all around us uh, in our modern world, he says, speaking from the first century BC. Now we see a corrupt Roman populace. How did it begin? Let's go back and we'll see it. And he also points out the, the, the thing that begins the process of decline. Uh, in another paragraph or so, he'll talk about the growth of luxury and wealth pouring into the, Ro into the city of Rome because of her overseas conquests. And he talks about how this av avarice and luxury uh, will contribute to mo Rome's moral decline. But that doesn't cause it. It's not the original cause. If that were true, 
If it were luxury and wealth and material blessing that causes moral decline and corruption, then we wouldn't see God in the Old Testament promising material blessings to the Jews if they're faithful to him. There's something else, and Livy puts his finger on it accurately for a pagan. He says, uh, the sinking of the foundations of morality as the old teaching was allowed to lapse. So you think about this. Livy says, if we look back in early history, we're going to see the Romans at their best when they're people of integrity, honor, industry, hard work, courage, thrift, and so on. All the virtues embodied in the ancient Romans. But if you have a generation of Romans who, who, who think and live that way, then uh, what is it that, uh, that brings about a change in the next generation? Why is the next generation not quite so good? And the next generation worse yet? And the next generation worse yet? And the answer, he says, is that the generation that holds to those virtues failed to pass on the old teaching. The old teaching is allowed to lapse. As Christians, we think to some very famous passages in the, in the scriptures that speak to parents. Deuteronomy 6, for example, where God, uh, through Moses, says, uh, Parents, teach your children uh, to remember these things that I've spoken to you this day. Teach them when you walk by the way, when you sit down, when you rise up. Uh, and many homeschoolers love this passage. We're supposed to be teaching our children all the time. Well, everybody should be, not just homeschoolers. But God is reminding the Israelites to teach their children who did not experience the things their parents did. Teach their children to remember these stories that God is the one who led them out of the land of Egypt, through the Red Sea, into the Promised Land, giving them houses they didn't build, wells they didn't dig, vineyards they didn't plant, and to remember that God gave them all those things, and so they would continue to be grateful and thankful and rejoice in God's blessings. But if the, if the parents didn't teach the children to remember these stories, and the children began to take for granted the blessings they have, and start to thinking that they deserve those blessings, that they're a given, that they get credit for it, uh, then they're going to face destruction. Well, this is, uh, this is classic Christian teaching, but Livy understands it as well. For a pagan, he is getting this right. If the, if the uh, original Roman generations uh, uh, understood virtue but failed to teach their children why these Romans were growing so great and so powerful, the children would take for granted the blessings that they've gotten uh, and forget to exercise the virtues that bring about these blessings and fall into corruption. And then, the crack having been introduced to the block of marble, you might say, uh, when the wealth and luxury uh, 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 enters into the picture, it continues to amplify and exaggerate the flaw that's already there. The flaw is already in the character. Uh, I've, uh, I've often used the analogy of a sidewalk, a city sidewalk, uh, that um, uh, if it's well built, then when water gets on it in the winter and the water freezes, no damage is done. But sidewalks crack and potholes form in roadways because water gets into cracks that are already there. And then when the water freezes in the cold of winter and the ice expands, it breaks up the concrete, breaks up the asphalt, uh, and, causes, uh, and causes flaws. So it's not actually the water or the ice that causes flaws. The water or the ice amplifies, takes advantage of, uh, exaggerates a flaw that was already there but, but, but invisible in, in, in fine weather. And so uh, luxury and wealth and power do not really corrupt. They amplify. So many people have heard the famous saying, uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. <clears throat> and in a sense, of course, uh, this is true in, in, a, in, a, in a general sense. But technically, it's really not. Power doesn't corrupt because we can all think of, uh, ex uh, of uh, cases, uh, rare exceptions they might be, but cases uh, in history where uh, men have wielded great power and not uh, been corrupt. So it's not really that power corrupts or that wealth and material luxury and so on corrupt is that they exaggerate the, the, the character of the person that holds them. So if you have a man of integrity, power is not going to corrupt him. It will amplify uh, and make more and more visible the integrity that was already present in his character. But if you have a man whose character is flawed, who hasn't conquered his flaws, who still struggles with vices, when he's given great power of some kind, whether it's political power uh, or military power or financial power, uh, the power he gives will simply uh, amplify, exaggerate, uh, reveal more manifestly whatever character he already had. So power of any kind is more like an amplifier than, uh, than like the actual cause. It's interesting to note that the man who said that, that all power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, uh, was a Roman Catholic writing in the 1800s named Lord Acton. He was a British nobleman. He was writing uh, uh, in advance uh, of the uh, Roman Catholic uh, Council called Vatican I, which took place in 1870. And at uh, Vatican I, uh, on the agenda, uh, 
uh, was, the, um, uh, was the desire of the church to officially uh, declare the doctrine of the infallibility of the Pope. Now, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church for a long time had held to the idea uh, that power resides uh, in a conciliar way among the bishops, and there had been a popular notion that the Pope may be infallible when he speaks uh, ex cathedra, uh, but it's not something that became official doctrine until the 1870s, and so here's a Roman Catholic objecting to the idea and saying power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Well, he understood this idea that it's not really power that corrupts, but it manifests the flaws in characters. And he, like all Christians, understands that man is flawed. And so we want to safeguard uh, uh, and separate uh, power from individual human beings. So here Livy uh, is talking this way. He says, it's not the wealth and the material luxury that flowed into the Roman world from their military conquests. Uh, it's the problem of uh, one generation of parents not passing on to the next generation of young people the virtues by which Rome has achieved her successes. It's the lapse of the old teaching. Well, then he goes on and he says, we watch as we study history, the sinking of the foundations of morality as the old teaching is allowed to lapse, then the rapidly increasing disintegration, then the final collapse of the whole edifice and the dark dawning of our modern day when we can neither endure our vices nor face the remedies needed to cure them. And here again, uh, it's, a, it's a, a brilliant mental image. He asks us to imagine the Roman culture and civilization as a great edifice like a great cathedral, but it's built on shifting sands on a swamp. And at first the cathedral stands erect and glorious and noble, but then the foundations start to sink into the swamp and the building starts to lean a little bit and the windows crack and puffs of dust come out of the windows. And then the steeple falls over and the stones start to crack and eventually the whole building collapses in a great roar of rubble and sinks into the gaseous bubbling swamp. This is the mental image that Livy is trying to ask us to imagine. Imagine Roman culture as a building falling apart as it sinks at its foundations into the swamp of degeneracy and corruption. And he says the culmination of all this is the dark dawning of our modern day. Now think about some stormy morning, stormy morning when you've woken up and where the sunrise should be in the east uh, with a glorious, beautiful sun shedding its rays across the landscape, there's nothing but dark ominous storm clouds and you say this is going to be a good day to stay in bed with a book and a cup of coffee the dark dawning of that day well livy says that's what our culture is like now the dark dawning of a modern day that bodes uh, that, that bodes ill for all there's nothing to look forward to but more corruption uh, more uh, um, more degeneracy uh, we can neither endure our vices nor the remedies needed to cure them uh, modern political and cultural conservatives love to quote this passage, and it's a great passage. And if you think about our, uh, uh, the way that many conservatives think about the condition of modern America, uh, very few people would say we are in an ideal state. We're deep in debt. Uh, there are laws passed that Christians think are, uh, are, are unethical. Uh, we have the problems of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the legalization of abortion. Uh, of, um, uh, of all kinds of things that we disagree with. We have all kinds of difficulties in our country, but when we ask what will solve these problems, uh, any solution involves somebody sacrificing his welfare benefits, somebody having to tighten his belt, somebody having to give up rights, and nobody wants to sacrifice their rights. So we cannot endure our vices if we keep on going this way, deep in debt, uh, uh, unethical laws, whatever we point to, if we keep going this way, uh, we, we, we see nothing but bleakness. But all the solutions to it are unendurable. No one's willing to face them. So we can neither endure our vices nor the remedies needed to cure them. This is an absolutely untenable position. We're on the horns of a dilemma. And so in this position, a cultural conservative, that's, that is someone who wants to preserve the good things of the past that are handed on to us for a benefit, like the great books, the great ideas of the past, uh, the doctrines of historic Christianity, the doctrines of cultural politics. Uh, someone who is a cultural conservative and wants to retain those becomes sick at heart, becomes discouraged as he looks at the world around them, a world that, that uh, recognizes it's heading for destruction, but refuses to face up to the discipline of the solutions that will solve the problems. A conservative is sick at heart and says, how do we get in this mess? How will we give, get out? There's no hope. That's the kind of sickness that Livy talks about in the next sentence, when he says the study of history is the best medicine for a sick mind. Now, he's not talking, of course, about the ultimate sickness. We Christians know that the ultimate sickness is only cured by the gospel. Uh, 
uh, by the incarnation of, this, of, the, uh, of uh, Jesus Christ, God come in the flesh, his death and resurrection, and so on. But Livy is talking about the kind of sickness that conservatives feel when we look with despair at the mess that we're in. And he says, the study of history is the best medicine for that kind of a sick mind. Why? Because in the study of history, you can see the, a record of the infinite variety of human experience plainly set out for all to see. And in that record, you see ex examples, find things to imitate, base things to avoid. In history, we get perspective. We can see that other nations and other cultures have been where we are. We are not the first one. It's not very likely that the problems we face are, 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 are the first time humans have faced this problem. People have been in this predicament before. So the study of history gives us perspective, and we can rise above our despair by, by saying, oh, that's how they solved their problems before. Or, as the case may be, that's how they wrote out the problems when there was no solution, their culture would not face up to them, uh, and a few people managed to write it out as their culture collapsed and they went into some change of culture, some change of government or whatever. But at least this is how the thinking people, the philosophically mind pe minded people, survived without despairing ultimately. So the perspective we get in the study of history uh, helps us. He says in it we find the infinite variety of human experience. We see uh, good men uh, doing what they must for their country and for their families, uh, for their gods. We see bad men uh, sacrificing other people for their own benefit. And among those examples, then, we can choose whom we will imitate and whom we will avoid. So history gives us perspective, and that perspective keeps us from despairing when we see the darkness of the culture around us. Now, this is a, this is a tremendous philosophy of history, and this is a philosophy we're going to see from now on as we look at the other great histories uh, um, uh, written later in Western culture. Uh, even the Christians will say the same thing. We can learn from history, uh, because human nature doesn't change, as Thucydides uh, in our Greek discussions said. We can learn from history because uh, in history we see the, uh, the record of examples of goodness and badness, as Livy says here. And because in history we see we're not the only people to ever have suffered these things, and so we have perspective and we rise above the temptation to despair and discouragement. The study of history is the best medicine for a sick mind. To prepare for the lecture on book one of Livy's Early History of Rome, uh, read the book, uh, and I want you to notice in particular on the first couple pages, there are some introductory paragraphs where Livy talks about his philosophy of history. We're going to spend some time discussing that, so I want you to pay special attention to his discussion about what he's trying to do and why he's trying to do it and what he assumes about history. And then uh, you'll get into the discussion of early Roman history, uh, a brief a recounting of Aeneas and the founding of Rome by the Trojans, uh, the story of Romulus uh, founding the city of Rome, the story of the Sabine women, the capture of the Sabine women. Uh, so read those. Uh, and then we're going to talk briefly about the history of the monarchy. So as you read the rest of book one, you'll see the story of the kings of Rome. And then we're going to have some important comments uh, in the lecture about what brought about the end of the monarchy uh, and brought about the beginning of the most famous uh, 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 aspect of uh, Roman history, the Republic, or one of the most famous aspects. So when you get to the end of book one, uh, look at the story in the last number of pages that uh, uh, is uh, the straw that breaks the camel's back, upsets the Roman populace enough to overthrow the monarchy and start a republic.